it's such a pleasure to see this uh, concert hall filled like this. Thank you for all coming out. Um, first of all, a line from my favorite movie, movie somewhat uh, changed for RPI. Good morning, RPI. <laughs> no, come on. Good morning, RPI. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Jill and Jim Evans who put that slideshow together for you on the history of computing. It's something that I think we'll continue to add to over time, but that, that is just a great look at how long we've been at uh, this collaboration, not only with IBM, but uh, leading in, in computing at Rensselaer. Uh, we've had a terrific time over the, the last two days with workshops, demos, a live podcast, informative technical plenaries and panels, and a fun presentation by David Pogue last evening on this stage. Our first order of business this morning is to cut the ribbon. To do that, it is my pleasure to link up. Look at that, will you? <laughs> link up with the 19th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Martin A. Schmidt, class of 81, Marty, who is uh, in the Voorhees Computing Center with his guests and is poised to cut the ribbon for our new IBM Quantum System One computer. All yours, Mr. President. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so what that is, is we just lost power in this building. So uh, now we get to do a little bit of a tap dance up here. So uh, uh, we'll see how long it'll take to get back. Um, You know, it's that spooky science at a distance, which is a problem here. So, uh, so, uh, Mr. President, it's all yours. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, John? We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, great. All right, well, let's, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, delighted to see everybody here. And also, for the folks in MPAC, we'll join you shortly. But right now, we've got a ribbon cutting to do. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things. First of all, I think this is not only a great day for RPI, but frankly, it's a great day for the region, um, and so delighted to think about what the impact of this transformative technology is going to have, both for our university, for the region, and, and for all the students that are going to learn how to use quantum computing, and for the economic potential that this brings to the capital region and beyond. Um, we're here in the Voorhees Computer Center, which is a chapel that was uh, built in 1933 for the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, it has been our home for uh, computing at RPI since the 1970s. And, and behind us is the beautiful new quantum computer, which is right now fully operational. I'm joined here uh, by a bunch of colleagues that I want to introduce. Uh, first, let me begin, begin with Nick Grabowski. Grabowski, uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, one of the members, a co-president of our quantum computing club. Uh, Jay Gambetta who, Gambetta, who is the uh, uh, Vice President of Quantum Computing at IBM. Um, uh, Curtis Prem, who is the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of RPI and also co-founder of NVIDIA. Uh, our Congressman, Paul Tonko, uh, the CEO and President of IBM, Arvind Krishna. Havadan Rodriguez, my good friend and President of the University of Albany. And my Board Chair and Boss, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John Kelly. And then lastly, Queenie Sun, a co-president also of the RPI Quantum Computing Club. So I think with that, uh, now that uh, we're here, perhaps we can get some scissors and get to work. That was pretty good. Everybody knows you hand scissors like that. <laughs> OK, so let's see if we can do some work here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this needs 
And we'll see you in a bit, John. What a wonderful beginning to our day. So as our guests are making their way from the uh, VCC uh, to the concert hall, I'd like to show you a video of the installation of the IBM Quantum System 1 at RPI. You know, we certainly, we all collectively understood that quantum computing was happening, uh, that it was progressing, but it was a retreat with the board, the trustees, and the senior leadership of RPI that we held. Curtis was there, my board chair, John Kelly, who, who led the quantum computing developments at IBM for almost a decade. Um, and just the kind of conversations that happen when you're stepping away from the university and trying to reflect on where you're going. I give credit, Curtis and John a lot of credit, you know, because they catalyze the conversation about what are we going to do and what if we put a quantum computer on the campus? So exciting to be a part of this journey and to fund this different technology that is coming to campus that there was no way I could say no to this opportunity. And also another sort of selfish thing is when something this big happens, I'd like to see it happen in my lifetime. I don't want to donate money after I die and then wish good luck. RPI is, um, I think, very unique in higher education. Uh, you know, the first thing you obviously point to is it's the first engineering school in the country. Uh, and this is our, you know, bicentennial. But if you, if you look at its culture and the kind of education and the people that go into his students and come out of it as graduates, um, there's something special about it. Just the excitement of the kids looking at this quantum computer coming to campus, I could see myself in those kids' eyes where they're just saying, it's my computer, I get to go do what I want with it, I get to go conquer the world and change it for the better, I get to invent the next generation of computers. The original idea for a quantum club um, kind of came around in the spring before the quantum computer uh, actually got announced, funnily enough. Um, I was just really interested in quantum computing at the time, and I knew that there were other people at RPI interested, but it felt like there was no space that we could all gather and discuss our interests and discuss the progress we made. And I'm really a believer in, you know, um, independent study, learning, constantly growing, and teaching yourself things. But I'm also of the belief that having others to do that with helps a lot. I really like the environment that, like, Quantum Computing Club has. Like, it's very open to newcomers. Like, we, we don't have a lot of people who actually do know about quantum computing. And so, like, everyone is very willing to teach newer members. We have computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, even electrical engineers. Um, and we also have people from outside those fields who just want to see how quantum can be applied to their field. We have a lot of um, economists and uh, finance interested people um, who are interested in the applications of quantum in a finance focused way. There are so many fields from which you can enter. And at the time I happened to be uh, involved in a research project that was uh, in nuclear. And so I realized that it was applicable to, the, to nuclear. And so I kind of got into that on my own. And that is the field that currently interests me. Um, we also have been lately pushing for more um, events and special meetings, uh, usually featuring, say, a professor from at RPI or even outside RPI who can talk about an area of interest that they have a lot of expertise in. We're all like just starting out. I think that is what makes it like extremely exciting and you know, a really great career option as well. I have had the good fortune of knowing, uh, you know, President Schmidt for 25 years, right? So when I was, uh, you know, in grad school at MIT, he was in the faculty there and he was, you know, one of the foremost faculty of MEMS, right, on microelectromechanical systems. 
And, uh, you know, and early on he was my academic, you know, part of my academic advisor there and giving advice. So I was always inspired by, uh, I mean, not only, you know, sort of like his, his visionary element of what was happening in technology, but also his human qualities, right? And he was always so focused on, on students and their education. And Dario and I were both at MIT at the same time. I was a faculty member running one of the larger laboratories there. He was completing his doctoral degree with another faculty member. So I knew him back then, and we've been in touch throughout the years. So leaving that retreat in March, um, we agreed that I would talk to Dario and see if he'd be willing to put an IBM quantum computer on a university campus for the first time. We had a, a fun moment when uh, he called me one day and he says, hey, can we have dinner, you know, later this week? It's like, it's a little bit tight. He's like, you know, how about on Sunday? Can you do it on Sunday? It's like, okay, yeah, let's meet on Sunday. And uh, we sat down at a restaurant here in Northern Westchester and it was like the genesis of the discussing of the possibilities of bringing a quantum computer to RPI. So I drove down to uh, Yorktown Heights. We had a lovely dinner and happily by the end of the dinner, uh, we got, reached an agreement that we would place an IBM computer, IBM's quantum computer on the RPI campus. IBM and Rensselaer have had a long collaboration through history. I came to Rensselaer because of IBM 360 3033 computer. And we've done a lot together, like the supercomputer. It's the fastest computer at a private university, help funded by the state of New York. And now we basically are looking at what is the next generation. And it just became a natural fit for Rensselaer and IBM to work together on this project as well. So why put all this in the Voorhees Computing Center? Uh, it's a hundred year old building, a former chapel to a convent. You know, you could put it in one of our shiny new buildings instead. It turns out that the utilities in that building are actually very strong. The cooling loop uh, for water, the UPS system, the backup generator, because of the data center that's already there. It turns out the site that we picked for things inside of that room, inside of that building, has some interesting juxtaposition with the old and the new, religious and technology. The, the IBM System 1 quantum computer is a little different. It is a visual statement piece by IBM. This is not the boring box sitting in a back room. This thing is a visual statement. It's futuristic, it's striking, it glows. It's just not unique, it's, it's fitting. It is an attraction point to RPI and it really does symbolize where RPI is going with IBM and how we're leading the future. We had the opportunity to take the Kiss, IBM's Kiss Kids Summer School, and it was a two-week program, I believe. It was pretty challenging. Um, needed to have a lot of background in linear algebra and probably some quantum mechanics. The Kiss Kid Boot Camp was uh, useful in uh, both uh, polishing up some skills uh, with regard to quantum computing uh, coding, and also learning some new stuff uh, about other problems that uh, I'm not actively working on. There's a huge interest in quantum computing at, on campus right now. Um, I attended one of the early student events and the students were crazy to know about what's going on. They are so excited to learn about quantum and to have the quantum system here at RPI. I think um, a misunderstanding a lot of people make is they hear you know, quantum computing and they're like, oh, I need to be a physics and computer science and mathematician and all these things uh, to you know, even grasp this. But I think it's pretty graspable um, at a basic level for people who, you know, don't have exposure to all those different fields. All of our students will have access to the quantum computer. Um, we're very excited about getting them, undergrads, graduates, PhD students, everybody on board on the system. At IBM, we have dedicated the last several years, actually the last several decades, to moving quantum computing out of the lab and into the hands of our global ecosystem who will be critical in making the promise of quantum computing a reality. Housing an IBM quantum system at a university, especially one as rich in 
creativity and scientific knowledge as RPI will serve as a cornerstone of pushing the boundaries of quantum computing into the next level. We are so grateful to IBM for the major investment it has made in Yorktown Heights and Poughkeepsie in research and manufacturing for quantum computing. Now, RPI faculty and students can explore quantum computing's most promising potential applications in Troy, New York. New York's Hudson River Valley has the potential to become Quantum Valley. It's exciting to think about the new research discoveries that will come from this region, but also the new enterprises that can be created as quantum computing enables new businesses and industries. Through my career, I've actually tried many different things in the philanthropy world. And I ultimately concluded the best usage of your money is actually in education, because you get a 10 to one return on your money. I just hope that every discipline, every department at Rensselaer can come up with something that is so unique that we had never, ever thought of before. So certainly there's challenges of taking a building that's almost 100 years old and putting this type of technology in it. And so as we come up with uh, issues, people have worked their way through it. So initially, we were concerned about two things in putting a quantum computer in, temperature and vibration. Uh, temperature is pretty much controlled within the cryostat, but vibration is really uh, a result of what, what's the environment around it. Uh, one of the unknowns was vibration. How springy was that building? Because a quantum computer cannot handle vibration. So we did some instrumentation for about a week. As it turns out, that floor was very damp, which is good. No vibration or very little vibration would transmit. That was excellent. But a related challenge was just the load, the static load. It weighs about five tons and we had no drawings engineering drawings to indicate how well reinforced it was, how strong was the concrete, et cetera. So that became a primary challenge, which we overcame by building a platform, if you will, above the floor, running columns from this platform all the way down through the basement of the VCC, through the raised floor, down to a massive footing that we placed in the ground. The heart of the quantum computer is something that's referred to as the cryostat. A cryostat is basically a series of concentric containers that get much colder as you go in and much colder as you go down. So this cryostat, which contains something that's called a chandelier, looks like an upside down tower. In our computer, we will never see that chandelier. It's housed within all these cans that form the cryostat and the cryostat is then suspended within the vitrine, which is what we call the computer itself. The cryostat delivery date was a big deal. To us, it marked a significant milestone. Okay, from here, we're actually making this thing operate. When I saw the cryostat being delivered, I thought, this is it, this is real. We're here, and I was really excited. Cryostat is basically a chamber in which you can control temp the temperature of your sample, for example, the, 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 the quantum chip. So the cold in the quantum computer is there because you don't want any thermal interference with the qubits. So the qubits are spin states, and they must be isolated as much as possible from the, from the environment for us to use them as a computational bit. It's maintained at such a cold temperature much, much colder than outer space. By getting the quantum chip that cold allows for manipulation and observation of the components that make up a qubit. I've been asked a number of times about the top challenges. So the IBM Quantum System 1 is housed within a, a glass housing. It's, a, it's basically a large glass cube. 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot. 
And the glass that makes up the four walls and the top of that is very special glass. There's only two manufacturers in the world, I understand, that could produce this museum quality glass. This glass was sourced on a factory in Milan, Italy. Quite a journey just to get the glass here from Italy. They had to get into the VCC. Turns out it doesn't have door openings big enough to get a 10 foot wide plus a couple more inches in. We ended up removing a 11 foot high window 40 feet off the ground and used cranes to move those five pieces of glass into the chapel. We had folks lined up all around upstairs on the mezzanine level of the VCC watching this operation and there was not a lot of room for error. That was pretty challenging, but all that worked, and it worked because the right people came together to think about the problem, work their way through the problem, and, uh, and then execute. There was originally a poll sent out, or like a Google form, for people to put names, and then the top three names of those were selected. And then out of those, one day in the union, they kind of just brought out all the ice cream for everyone to try and then vote on the name. And the name ended up being Quantum Freeze. It just tastes like pretty good, like sweet. <laughs> just like an ice cream. Um, it reminds me of like cotton candy, maybe. Like I feel like this is something I'd taste at like a carnival or something. I think the taste is very nice, but the thing I like the most is the little like bits in it. I think the ice cream is pretty cold. Um, I don't think you could house a quantum computer in this ice cream. This ice cream is like just frozen, so that would be like zero degrees Celsius. Uh, the cryostat is zero degrees Kelvin, so <laughs> that's quite a long way to go. I think if I liked ice cream as cold as the cryostat, I would probably be stuck to it. This tastes pretty good, so I can't say that would be a bad thing necessarily. If the ice cream was that cold, I think my tongue would fall off. I don't really like cones. I went for a pint. Okay. <laughs> what our students help bring to this enterprise is a lack of preconceptions. It takes young minds to question the status quo and to come up with new ideas and new directions. Only in a research environment are we able to do that. We have computer scientists and engineers and architects and we have artists that all need to figure out and learn together. And that togetherness at RPI, that interdisciplinary nature is the secret sauce of RPI. And now put a quantum computer on top of that and the world is ours. We're at the very special point in time now because RPI actually has both. It has the high-performance computing platform as well as the quantum machine. And in order to, to leverage the computational advantage of quantum computing, in the near future we have to use both. The students that will train here, that will be training on quantum computers, will, will be the ones, will be basically the pioneers. It will attract researchers who want to have access to the quantum computer because they want to develop applications and software. It will attract students because they know that that's the future. Yeah, I decided to stay at RPI because we're getting the quantum computer and uh, it would be a fantastic uh, facility to use to further my research. Normally a project of this magnitude takes years to happen. And we've gone from conception to reality in just a year. And uh, in scientific terms, that's like going to zero to 60 uh, in just a few seconds. IBM will tell you now that this is the fastest installation of this system that they've ever done. And a lot of that is due to the quality of work here and workers here at Rensselaer working with the people from IBM. Our experimental machine shop was critical at least a dozen times and quickly turning around changes to components for IBM. Everybody on this team loves to solve problems. They don't necessarily like the problems, but they like solving problems. It's been extraordinary teamwork to make this project happen so quickly.
what it means is to remain at the forefront of this long journey of the story of computation and to allow a whole new generation of students and faculty to imagine a new way of representing information, a new way of computing. This is an inflection point for RPI with respect to the next 200 years or even the next 50 years. When, when you think about quantum computing, you have to realize that it's not just an incremental change to classical computing. It is a completely different mindset and different approach. It's an incredibly bold initiative, uh, but we will take advantage of it and we will make sure that RPI uh, is on everybody's lips when it comes to the field of quantum computing. I think the nation needs universities like RPI to survive and thrive. And so part of what's exciting about this moment is what is our model for the future? How do we want to operate as, as things evolve? Now, as a nation, we struggle with um, economic divides, with political divides. And in a lot of ways, um, some of that has to do with the concentration of wealth that's occurred over the past 40 years. We're not going to survive by superstar cities, you know, a set of cities on the easier coast that are really driving economic development. There are certain metropolitan areas that are basically poised to, to grow and to contribute to the economic growth of the nation. And I think the capital region, where RPI sits, is one of those regions. And so that makes it a very interesting opportunity, which is how do we as a region, with RPI as a key participant of that, how do we frame our future in a way in which 40 years from now, um, the economic vibrancy of this region is phenomenal and is contributing to a, a healthier, more balanced uh, nation. Well, that, that was terrific. A lot of hands uh, went into putting that video together, but our very own Eleanor Goldsmith uh, was the videographer who just did a great job. And assuming that the power stays with us, um, it is now my distinct honor to introduce our guest speakers in reverse order of speaking and ask that they take their seats on the stage, and then I will introduce them one by one uh, to call them to the podium. First is the RPI Chair of our Board of Trustees, John E. Kelly III. Second is the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, a name you might have heard once or twice, Curtis R. Prem. One of our partners here uh, from across the river, uh, the president of the University of Albany, Havadon Rodriguez. A person has been a great supporter of RPI and an engineer by education, Congressman Paul D. Tonko. One of the key partners here, I'm happy to invite to the stage, IBM CEO and Chairman of the Board, Arvid Krishna. And the last time I said, take it away, Mr. President, we lost the lights, but I'll try it again. Uh, the 19th President of RPI, Martin A. Schmidt. Thank you, John, um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, but not so much. I think it's been a total of nine months since we announced in June that we would do, the end of June, that we would do this, and to arrive at this moment with a fully operational computer is just so exciting and so uplifting. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who's here, from our friends from around the region and the country. As many of you know, 
RPI is today, this year celebrating its 200th birthday. Over the course of two centuries, RPI people have continuously invented, built, and shaped the infrastructure of the world around us. Everything from the Transcontinental Railroad to the Brooklyn Bridge to the microprocessor to the digital camera and to the graphic processing units or GPUs that are powering today advances in artificial intelligence. Today, at the beginning of our third century, RPI is once again breaking new ground. We are, as you've no doubt heard, the first university in the world to host an IBM quantum computing system on our campus and to fully explore quantum computing's possibilities. I have a lot of people to thank, but I want to start by recognizing the political leaders we have here in New York State. Leaders who have recognized something I came to understand in deciding to leave MIT and Kendall Square to take on the presidency of RPI. That is, with the right people and support, the Capital Region and New York State will rise further as a world-class technology hub. This year, Governor Kathy Hochul launched the Empire AI Consortium, which is designed to give RPI and other leading New York State universities access to the enormous resources required to train artificial intelligence models so we can help to shape the future of artificial intelligence. I'm delighted that Congressman Paul Tonko is here on stage with us, one of a few engineers in Congress and a great example of the value of having technologically savvy leaders in office to champion science and technology. I also want to acknowledge a few more leaders in the audience. We're joined by the City of, Mayor, City of Troy Mayor Carmela Mantello, New York's New York State Assemblyman John McDonald, New York State Assembly Member and Chair of the Assembly Higher Education Committee, Patricia Fahey. And finally, New York State Senator Jake Ashby. And I also want to extend my thanks to two people who are not here this morning, United States Senators Kristen Gillibrand and Chuck Schumer. They recently secured federal funding for RPI's new Center for Robotic Manufacturing Systems. I'm, of course, very happy. <laughs> I'm, of course, very happy that Dr. Arvind Krishna of IBM is with us and will speak to you shortly. Over many decades, IBM and RPI partnerships in research and education have been extraordinary. We are so excited to have IBM's utility-scale quantum system on campus. It's a triumph of science and engineering. I won't take the time to describe the technical details except for one. In order to preserve the fragile quantum states of the system's Eagle 127-qubit processor, it is suspended within a cryostatic chamber designed to keep temperatures near absolute zero, where almost all molecular motion ceases. This is 200 times colder than outer space. So now you understand why Stewart's named the ice cream quantum freeze. I also want to, welcome to uh, offer a welcome to President Havadon Rodriguez of the University of Albany, who is a tremendous partner in RPI's efforts to help our regional economy skate to where the puck is going to be. We'll do this by partnering together in research and education and computing, and in particular, quantum computing. History has shown that when leading universities in a region find opportunities to work together, great things can happen. Now, I need to mention a few key RPI people. I'm so grateful to the vice chair of our board of trustees, Curtis Prem, of the class of 1982, whose generosity and moment of inspiration made this day possible. <laughs> Curtis, as many of you know, is a co-founder of NVIDIA, and he developed the architecture for the GPUs that have made NVIDIA the world leader in chips for artificial intelligence. Curtis was at a board retreat when he asked our board chair, Dr. John Kelly, of the classes of 1978 and 1980. If there, wasn't, if there was any reason why RPI couldn't 
have an IBM quantum system. John, who oversaw innovation at IBM for many years, mentioned the cost as one reason, and the fact that IBM, which had never put a quantum, computer, quantum system on a university campus, would have to agree. Well, Curtis instantly said that he'd take care of the first obstacle, the cost. <laughs> and within a few days, I had scheduled a dinner with Dario Gill, IBM director of research, to take care of the second. The rest is history. This project, as you saw in the video, came together extremely rapidly. And I need to thank, and I must thank, John Cole, Jeff Miner, Jackie Stampalia in the division of the Chief Information Officer, and Ernie Katzwinkel, Steve Quinn, and the rest of the facilities management team. They deserve enormous credit for getting this system beautifully settled on our campus in the chapel at the Voorhees Computer Center and bringing it online. Having this system here in Troy is important for three reasons. First, while it is easy to predict that quantum systems are going to rapidly become essential because of their computational power, what we don't yet fully know is how best to use them. We anticipate that there will be important applications in biomedicine, in modeling climate and predicting weather, in materials design and many other fields. Together, with this quantum computer, we will explore applications, develop algorithms, and in so doing, help humanity solve some very large problems. Second, with this quantum system, RPI is adding to the region's advantages in next generation computing and creating what economists like to describe as an agglomeration effect, bringing entities in a region together such that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We already have an example of that here with New York Creates and its Albany Nanotech Complex. This region has long had the most advanced public semiconductor research and development facility in North America. Today, this region is crucial to realizing the CHIPS Act goal of restoring American leadership in semiconductor innovation and manufacturing. So it's not a surprise that one of the first major CHIPS Act awards recently went to the Northeast Regional Defense Technology Hub, or what we refer to as NordTech. And this is a partnership, a partnership of the University of Albany, Cornell, IBM, New York Creates, and RPI. Adding a quantum valley aspect to Tech Valley is not only going to draw new businesses here and encourage startups, but also offer the region's existing businesses early insights into what it means to be quantum advantaged. And finally, third, because we have this quantum system close at hand, RPI and our friends at UAlbany are going to be out in front in answering the question, how does the United States educate a quantum ready workforce for the near future? We'll also wanna help other regional colleges and universities educate their students for this new computing paradigm. RPI students are more than ready for the future. In fact, they spontaneously founded the RPI Quantum Computing Club as soon as this addition to campus was announced. And so now I'm going to invite one of the club's co-presidents to the podium, Michael Papadopoulos. Michael, please join us. Good morning, everyone. I want to first thank President Schmidt for giving me this opportunity to speak on the quantum computer. Um, I think I don't just speak for the Quantum Computing Club, but perhaps the entire student body when I express uh, how excited I am about this quantum computer's installation. I want to emphasize most of all in my speech who I think stands the most to gain from this. It's all the students now and in the future of RPI who want to learn and grow and change the world. We have a device of incredible power that puts us at the bleeding edge of computation right now. So I want to make a bit of a call to action for everyone. Learn, grow, read, get informed, run programs on the quantum computer, be curious, get involved with RPI's quantum community, 
talk to professors and start research projects in quantum, become quantum leaders of the future at RPI and beyond. As I close, I want to thank all our honor guests for making this possible. For their contribution to quantum computing, I invite the Quantum Computing Club to come up and present them with quarter zips, making them honorary members of the Quantum Computing Club. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So clearly, the leadership of our Quantum Computing Club is strong and just got a whole lot stronger. Who could imagine that the club now has a Fortune 100 CEO? <laughs> a congressman, a couple of university presidents, a co-founder of NVIDIA, <laughs> and the board chair of RPI. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for that. From the moment of RPI's founding in 1824, the education we offered was radically hands-on. We were one of the first schools in the world to teach students by asking them to perform their own experiments and field work. Back in his student days, Curtis Prem chose RPI over MIT because RPI offered terminals that allowed our students to directly interact with our IBM mainframe, a rare opportunity. Today, that RPI tradition of ubiquitous computing continues. RPI is very unusual in that even undergraduates had the opportunity to use our Amos supercomputer, the most powerful classic computer at an American private university. And the same will hold true for the IBM Quantum System One. I cannot wait, I cannot wait to see what our students discover on this pioneering system. If 200 years of history are a guide, those discoveries are going to transform our world. I thank you again for joining us, and please enjoy the rest of the program. Uh, thank you, Marty, that's terrific. Uh, next, let me introduce uh, a really incredible partner of Rensselaer, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of IBM, Dr. Arvind Krishna. As a business leader and technologist, he has led the building and expansion of new markets for IBM in artificial intelligence, cloud, quantum computing, and blockchain. He has also played a significant role in the development of innovative IBM products and solutions based on these emerging technologies. Over his 30-year career at IBM, Arvid has led a series of bold transformations and delivered proven business results. He has been an outspoken advocate for learning at every stage of one's career, he has made scientific contributions in several technical fields, including wireless networking, security systems, and databases. And by the way, on one of the first times I met Dr. Krishna, I was traveling with the provost at Watson Research Center, and his first question just about as soon as we sat down was, how long before the von Neumann architecture or classical computing uh, gets replaced? And I wasn't ready for the question, but little did I know that conversation would lead to where we are today. So let me ask the chairman and CEO of IBM to join us here, Arvind Krishna. So good morning, everyone. And thank you all for turning out 
and for helping really make this a momentous event. So I want to thank uh, President Schmidt, and I'm going to echo some of his remarks. First, thank you to Curtis, but also to the entire Board of Trustees for making this happen, but also to all of the uh, might of New York State, starting from the governor, Governor Hochul, for her commitment to science and technology, but also all of the congressmen, the state senators, and our U.S. senators, and our U.S. congressmen for being such strong supporters of science and technology within the state. I couldn't be more excited about the launch of the Quantum System 1 here at RPI. First, this is the very first IBM quantum system at any university. I think that speaks. I think that speaks a lot to the fortitude as well as the foresight of your faculty and staff. I'm going to first just spend a moment on the excitement this brings in potential economic growth. These systems are going to solve problems that we cannot. Note, I'm using the word cannot, not might, not will, but cannot solve on today's computers. Problems in materials, problems in maybe carbon sequestration, problems around drug discovery, problems in lightweight materials, lubricants, EV battery materials, problems that are in the end, when you think about it intuitively, they come from a world of physical chemistry, which means that they are, they are subject to the principles of quantum mechanics, which is why these systems, which kind of simulate nature, are the ones that are going to let us make progress on these problems. There's other problems around stochastics and financial risk, which, let me tell you, our banking clients are extremely excited about. And that, I think, is going to bring further, because if you think about Albany, it's only a couple of hours from New York City, which is the world's epicenter for those kinds of problems. So this is the first part that I'm really, really excited about this. The second part is around what the university can do uniquely. None of this is going to be possible without workforce development. And at the heart of workforce development is what the faculty can do and what the students can do. As President Schmidt already said, students are going to imagine using these systems in ways that even the inventors of these systems can't conceive. I reeled off a set of potential use cases. I believe they have a lot of value. I'll make a bet that within five years, Students and faculty here are going to dream up use cases that are far beyond uh, what we are imagining. This is just as what has happened in technology again and again over 70 years. I'll take a really mundane example. Most people here have heard of databases. Most databases were invented by the inventors because they thought reporting and analytics was important. It turned out that transaction processing is what the world used them for. That is not what the inventors had in mind, believe me. Most of the database students even don't realize that today. So there are so many use cases, and I believe the opportunity and economic growth will be measured in the hundreds of billions over the next few years, think five to seven, and then in the trillions after that. For anybody who has, like what, how is this going to happen? Just look at what Curtis and his colleagues have achieved at NVIDIA. And I think that's a great proof point of what happens over 15 years of a dedicated vision and expansion. So this is going to be a really exciting journey we are on together. We at IBM are excited about working together. And applying this is going to be one of the most exciting. People talk about tough. Certainly, building these systems is hard. Uh, President Schmidt talked about the temperatures, the cryostats, the maintenance, the superconductors, the materials, the algorithms. Yes, all of that is hard. But how we use it, how we apply it, how we do more research on it is much more exciting. So with that, thank you. Thank you again to RPI and to everyone here. Thank you, Arvid. That was terrific. Uh, next, let me introduce uh, Congressman Paul D. Tonko. 
Serving our region since 1983, Paul Tonko has used his degree in mechanical industrial engineering from that other college, and his deep engineering knowledge, skill, and creativity in the State Assembly, NYSERDA, and the Halls of Congress to improve the quality of life of countless Americans. Representing New York's 20th Congressional District in the Capital Region, Congressman Tonko has dedicated his career to creating good jobs, driving economic opportunity, and supporting the science, research, and higher education communities across the country. Please join me in welcoming on to, uh, to the podium, Congressman Paul Tonko. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Well, it's an honor to join here with our president, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much, uh, Marty, for your vision and for your leadership and uh, to the entire RPI family. Thank you to uh, Dr. Krishna, CEO of IBM and all of the IBM individuals. Thank you for that partnership that is so very important and to uh, know that you're gonna network with um, President Rodriguez and SUNY Albany is a powerful statement. So great to be with all of you today as a proud member of the RPI Quantum Computing Club. It is awesome to join you um, in this opportunity. But in all seriousness, this is a moment I think we shall all recall. It is a great honor to join you uh, as we make history today, not just for our beloved capital region or the state of New York, but for the entire world as we embark on a journey that will help reshape the landscape of technology and science as we know it. This is an eclipsing from traditional computing. Obviously, in a world of semiconductor and macroelectronics, microelectronics, nanotechnology, algorithms, and artificial intelligence. There are challenges, but opportunities that abound. And today, we're embracing that challenge. I want to extend my deepest congratulations to both RPI and IBM, to the faculty here, to the students, and all those who have contributed to this monumental achievement. Your dedication, innovation, and unwavering commitment to excellence have brought us to this most impressive occasion. The introduction of the IBM Quantum System One represents a significant leap forward, a leap forward in computing technology. It opens up a realm of possibilities that were once confined exclusively to our dreams or the world of science fiction. With its unparalleled processing cap capabilities, quantum computing holds the potential to revolutionize fields ranging from medicine and finance to cybersecurity to green energy and certainly to artificial intelligence. But let us not forget the journey that brought us here today, a journey marked by countless hours of research and collaboration, fueled by the belief that we can unlock the secrets of this universe and build a better future for generations to come. Certainly a journey that's been hosted by this 200-year history of an RPI uh, institutional approach to growing the workforce of the future. It's always been their mission and they do it so marvelously well, a premier institution. This journey that should inspire reflection on the importance of investing in STEM education, in workforce development, in good jobs so that we may empower the next generation of innovators, of problem solvers and leaders who will continue to push the boundaries of human knowledge and shape the world around us. To have the first quantum computer on a college campus to be right here in our capital region is a testament to the caliber of talent in upstate New York, as well as the prestige of RPI as an institution. It is the result of hard work of countless individuals who dedicate themselves to advancing human knowledge and deep understanding. But our work does not end here. Down in Washington, my colleagues and I continue to push efforts in Congress to advance this technology and understand the innovative possibilities that quantum computers hold. I was proud to help write and support the Chips and Science Act signed into law in 2022, which funded investments in core quantum research programs for fundamental scientific discoveries. And back in November of 23, I proudly supported the passage of the National Quantum Initiative Re Reauthorization Act out of our House Science, Space, and Tech Committee. These bills are a strategic move toward U.S. leadership in quantum technology through the development of a quantum-ready workforce, the creation of a new quantum test bed, enhancing federal research labs, and establishing centers for quantum sensing, measurement, and engineering. 
As we stand on the threshold of a new era in computing, let us indeed embrace the opportunities that lie ahead with optimism and determination. Let us harness the power of quantum computing to tackle our most pressing challenges and unlock new frontiers of discovery and innovation. I truly believe that the pioneer spirit is part of our DNA as a nation. And so I thank RPI and IBM for showcasing this so vibrantly today and for leading the way. And I thank you all who have joined in celebrating this momentous occasion. Together, let us embrace the future with a sense of endless possibility. And as we continue to work through the semiconductor efforts with an NTSC, a national, um, a national um, semiconductor training and tech center, let us understand that this area here is sound justification for the location of that center. We have the workforce development through our campuses and through our community colleges. We have manufacturing that has been invested in already with the uh, Science and Tech and Inflation Reduction Act and Chips and Science Act. So let us continue forward with that. And we certainly have the research centers at these campuses like RPI, SUNY Albany, and in the private sector in GERD. So we're a natural fit. We're gonna continue, I will continue to advocate for that center to be located right here. This is just another layering of justification. And again, congratulations to the entire team for making this happen. Let's go forward and upward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Congressman Tonko. Uh, so, a little bit of an aside, if you thought that the room moved a little bit, we really did just have an earthquake in the northeast here, so there's still some spooky science at a distance that's going on here. It was actually 4.7 down in New Jersey, uh, so everything's fine, we're all good, but we'll just keep moving, but uh, uh, there's some fun things happening this morning. <laughs> so. Uh, Next, let me introduce the president of the University of Albany, uh, Dr. Havadon Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is the 20th president of the University of Albany, <clears throat> one of the nation's most diverse public research universities. Under Dr. Rodriguez's leadership, University of Albany has opened a state-of-the-art teaching and research facility, won $75 million in state support for a University of Albany-led Albany Artificial Intelligence Supercomputing Initiative, and other uh, uh, initiatives. During Dr. Rodriguez's tenure, University of Albany has extended the reach of its globally significant research while also becoming a national leader for educational equity and social mobility. Dr. Rodriguez has over 30 years of experience as a leader in higher education and is a respected social scientist and scholar of disaster response and resiliency. That's why he's on the stage today for earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Dr. Havadon Rodriguez. Thank you so much. I, I guess the cue for me today was the, uh, the earthquake that was just announced, uh, but all is good, so don't fear. Good morning, everyone. Muy buenos dias. Uh, thank you, Congressman Tanko, for your tireless and unwavering support to higher education, the capital region, the great state of New York, and our nation. Your work is always greatly appreciated. And thank you to President Schmidt for including the University at Albany in today's event. As your neighbor across the river, we, are you, we at UAlbany are simply thrilled to see RPI continuing to reach new heights. There is a saying sometimes attributed to John Lennon that goes, count your age by friends, not years. As we mark UAlbany's 180th anniversary, and RPI celebrates its bicentennial this year, we are very pleased that we can count on each other as friends and as partners. Since President Schmidt walked in the door as the president of RPI, we've been having engaging conversations about building regional collaborations and partnerships, as we should as the only two Research One institutions in the region. UAlbany and RPI have a strong partnership that will continue to grow with the addition of this incredible technology. 
And it is important to leverage our respective strengths and assets to the benefit of each of our institutions and our communities in the capital region and beyond. Earlier this year, you Albany installed the first prototype IBM Artificial Intelligence Unit Computing Cluster, being, bringing the first of its kind technology to the region. Today's ribbon cutting on RPI's IBM Quantum System 1 further establishes the capital region as a major hub, if I should say, as the epicenter for high-tech research. Just saying. And this type of technology is not only about new technology and innovation, although this, of course, is an important goal. It also leads to workforce and economic development, taking the benefits of research out of the laboratory and bringing them into the lives of everyday people. UAlbany is committed to doing world-class research that benefits the public good. And we are thrilled to have strong partners in RPI and IBM working with us towards that goal. President Smith, Arvind Krishna, and the entire RPI and IBM teams, congratulations, or as we say in Spanish, felicidades. I look forward to continuing to work with you to benefit our region, in our world. We have a saying at the University at Albany that today is a great day to be a great Dane. And let's add that today is also a great day to be an RPI engineer. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Um, by the way, the, w I keep getting updates as I'm going off stage for you. So uh, <laughs> uh, the epicenter was halfway between Allentown and Elizabeth uh, in New Jersey. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll keep updating you as we go. <laughs> so so let, now let me introduce the vice chair of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute Board of Trustees, Curtis R. Prem, class of 1982. Mr. Prem co-founded NVIDIA Corporation, a manufacturer of graphics and multimedia integrated circuits, in 1993 and was its chief technical officer from 93 to 2003. From 1986 to January 1993, Prem was the senior staff engineer at Sun Microsystem, where he architected the GX graphics products, uh, graphics products including the world's first single chip graphical user interface, or GUI accelerator. Prem is an inventor with approximately 200 U.S. and international patents, all of which relate to graphics and input-output systems. He holds a, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering degree from, from Rensselaer, and he received the Albert Fox Demurers Award in 2005 from the RAAA, or the Rensselaer Alumni Association, and the 2000 Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Severino Center at RPI. He's a member of the Stephen Van Rensselaer Society of Patroons at Rensselaer. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Mr. Curtis R. Prem. Well, first of all, I want to welcome you to the most technically advanced performing arts center in the world. <laughs> And it's earthquake proof. <laughs> I'd also, here we have the fastest supercomputer at any private university in the known galaxy. <laughs> and today, we are the only university that has a quantum computer across the quantum verse. So some of you know what I'm talking about. I was not bitten by a spider, but I was sure bitten by the quantum bug. And with the installation today and the dedication, uh, you just can tell all our quantum senses are tingling. I'd like to go back a little bit in time and connect our, where we started to where we are today. 
and there's not much of a difference. I'm giving away the ending. So in 1895, Palmer C. Ricketts wrote about Stephen Van Rensselaer and Amos Eaton in History of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. At the beginning of the century, the study of physical sciences in the United States was in its infancy. All branches were included under the terms natural philosophy and natural history. Their meaning was not well defined, although under the latter was generally included all of what was known as astronomy, physics, chemistry, and geology. Scarcely any provision was made for scientific instruction in any of the colleges in the country. So first, I, I want to talk about uh, natural history. And I actually am starting to really like the word. Um, but it really shows that uh, we don't understand the universe or nature as it stands. So I could get very um, deep into talking about who made the, the universe and stuff. but. Really, it's a discovery process for us. And along the way, uh, John, Kel um, John Kelly and I were talking, it's like, we're gonna have the quantum computer on campus so everybody can actually see it. And it ended up in the chapel and I asked John, you know, is it sacrilegious to actually have the quantum computer, such far technology, actually in our chapel? And he responded, you can't get any closer to God than quantum. <laughs> which is true. So um, Ricketts actually wrote this about 70 years after Rensselaer was founded, and that's when he could actually insert physics in for uh, natural history. So I'm not gonna insert physics into Stephen Van Rensselaer's uh, memos. I'm gonna insert the word quantum. We'll see how this goes. So in a letter dated November 5th, 1824, from Stephen Van Rensselaer to Re Reverend Samuel Blatchford of Lansingburg, was a notice of the foundation of Rensselaer School. Dear Sir, I have established a school at the north end of Troy in Rensselaer County in a building usually called the Old Bank Place for the purpose of instructing persons who may choose to apply themselves in the application of science to the common purposes of life. My principal objective is to qualify teachers for instructing the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics by lectures and otherwise in the application of experimental chemistry, natural um, philosophy, quantum, agriculture, domestic economy, the arts, <laughs> and manufacturers. I am inclined to believe that competent instructors may be produced in the school at Troy who will be highly useful to the community in the diffusions of very useful kind of some knowledge with the application to the business of living. Apparatus for the necessary experiments have been so simplified and specimens of quantum have become subjects of such easy attainment that but by a small sum is now required as an outfit for an instructor in the proposed branch of science. So it is very true that it was easy to obtain thanks to IBM, but um, Stephen, 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 um, $95 million is not a small sum. <laughs> as a few regulations are immediately necessary to order, in order to pre present the school to the public, it seems necessary that I should make some following orders subject to be altered by the trustees after the end of the first term. So there were 10 orders that he gave in the forming of Rensselaer. Like order number five was that tuition would be $25 per semester. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> as long as you promise to pay within one year. <laughs> That's been altered many times by the board. <laughs> but the, the important order was order number seven. In giving a course in quantum, 
These are not to be taught by seeing experiments and hearing lectures according to the usual method. But they, they are to lecture and experiment by turns under the immediate direction of a professor or a competent assistant. Thus, by a, a term of labor, like apprentices to a trade, they are to become operative, quantum, scientists, and engineers. Does this make sense now? <laughs> and so uh, I, I need to go back to why I picked Rensselaer. And uh, my decision was 46 years ago. I mean, this was written 200 years ago. But what I, I've learned some stuff this week that I didn't realize what the terminals meant because we had punch cards, and, and so Marty and I were talking about how long did it take for you to get your printout? And we sort of agreed it was about a half an hour, so you'd take your deck, submit it, come back in about a half an hour, see if your printout was there, go look at your printout, and then you realize that you forgot to put your password card in, so you resubmit it, come back at, you know, another half an hour. If you had a mistake, like three cards were wrong, you'd have to go over to the punch card um, terminal, and you'd stand in line like three deep, and then you'd just wait. And I mean, the, the person I was punching had like 50 cards to do. So the, the whole cycle time was about an hour. And, and you, you can't really be innovative if you're just waiting around for this. So with the quantum computer, um, the execution time is like in the matter of a second or two. But because of the air, they like to do 10,000 runs at a time, or what they call shots. So they will run 10,000 shots. It takes about 15 seconds. So it's a very interactive thing. Plus, the, each quantum computer is slightly different because of the noises at different uh, parts in it. So we actually have to learn how our quantum computer actually works, and we actually will become one with our quantum computer. The thing I learned that if you submit the same job anywhere to any of IBM's computers on the net, the worst case I've heard so far is it takes five days to get your results. So that you can just not be, you know, innovative when your turnaround time is, is five days. And even in like high school when, on a mechanical typewriter, how long did it take you without whiteout to actually produce, you know, one page? And it's like, okay, let's say it's 15, um, you know, minutes. I've never experienced five days. So I'm not going to say that the rest of the world outside of Rensselaer is in the Dark Ages, because they're actually in the Stone Age. <laughs> so the two things I want you to take away from this is, it is our culture from day one to have hands-on access to the apparatuses that we experiment with and we innovate with and that we teach with. And we're, it's sort of an, another renaissance that we're starting to realize it again, but we've had it, for me, we've had it with IBM 33, 3033 computer, we've had it with the supercomputer, and now we have it um, with quantum. And the second thing is our partnership with IBM, which we've been tasked to actually find the applications that actually work on the quantum computer, develop the software, for the quantum computer, and IBM needs Rensselaer to actually figure out the marketplaces that they're going to sell a godzillion of these quantum computers into. But to find these applications, develop these products for the common purpose, for the common, you know, people out there, um, that's actually pretty easy to, for us. I mean, we've been doing it for 200 years. So I want to thank everybody here and just Go use the machine. <laughs> Thank you, Curtis. And uh, with those time delays, uh, the latest update, um, <laughs> Dr. Schmidt, Dr. Krishna, you'll be very uh, happy to hear that the quantum computer is still working. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we'll even try to get a map up for you in a second. But uh, first, uh, let me introduce our closer today and uh, what a closer he is, the chair of our board of trustees, Dr. Johnny Kelly III. 
Dr. Kelly has four decades of experience innovating and leading in the information technology industry. During this time, he has played numerous significant technical and business roles driving IBM's leadership in technologies ranging from semiconductors to supercomputers to artificial intelligent cognitive systems. Most notably, Dr. Kelly and his team were responsible for advancing the science of AI and cognitive computing through the support for Watson, the groundbreaking system that defeated two standing Jeopardy world champions in 2011. And we still have uh, a box down in the supercomputing center, the original Watson box, or the second original Watson box. Dr. Kelly received a bachelor's of science degree in physics from Union College in 1976. He received a master's of science degree in physics from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1978, and his doctorate in materials engineering from RPI in 1980. Dr. Kelly is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, as my colleagues at IBM and RPI know, it's always fun when John Kelly makes up his mind that he wants to get something done, and you can see that in the next building over. So please join me in welcoming onto the stage Dr. John E. Kelly III. Well, good morning, everyone. What a great day. And thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction. I am thrilled that two of the great institutions in my life, IBM and RPI, are now doing this groundbreaking work in quantum computing after having worked continuously together for decades in high-performance computing. Now, as a, a quick personal sideline, and I think you'll understand how important this day is to me, as John mentioned, I came here, received a master's degree in physics, studied a lot of quantum physics. But in 1978, I realized that as much as I loved the physics and the math, I would never in my lifetime be able to build something using quantum physics. So I walked from the science building over to the materials engineering building and signed up for a doctorate in materials engineering, which worked out pretty well because I was able to drive Moore's Law or help drive Moore's Law for decades. When I left here, in September of 1980, I defended my thesis on a Friday afternoon. I took the weekend off, and I started at IBM on Monday morning. <laughs> and the rest is history. So as you can see, and this is a technology joke, my life with RPI and IBM have been highly entangled and superimposed. <laughs> so Mar look, Marty is correct that RPI now has a system quantum one, because of Curtis Prem and Arvind Krishna and his team. The background story that Marty shared at that board meeting really went more like this. Curtis leans over, he's actually, you were on my left, Curtis, and Curtis leans over and says, John, what does IBM do with their old quantum computers? And I said, we grind them up. For security reasons, you, do, you want to have it like sand so nobody can copy it. And he said, uh, well, how about we get one of them at RPI? And I said, well, that's never been done, number one, but I have a better idea. How about we get a new quantum computer? <laughs> and he says, okay. And I said, but that's going to cost some serious money, number one. He says, I got that fixed. <laughs> And then we, I said, and then we have to get IBM to do something they've never done and put a quantum computer, the family jewels, at a university. And that's where Arvind Krishna came in with the support of Dario Gill and made this happen. Now, this puts RPI at the absolute forefront, bleeding edge of quantum, of computer science. And I know for some, I watched yesterday through the technical presentations. For some people, they get a little bit nervous about that. Well, what are we really going to do with it? How do we fix the error correction? Well, what happens if an earthquake strikes in the quantum computer? Uh, it works. It works. But we have the talent here at RPI, and we have the partnership with IBM that I'm convinced will make this a huge success. And this is all about 
the students, and I'll end with that in a second. But I also have to tell a little bit of a personal concern I had through this process. When we said, well, Curtis solved the money problem, and now President Schmidt is going down to talk to Dr. Gill, who leads IBM Research, I thought to myself, two MIT guys getting together to discuss putting a quantum computer at RPI, am I taking a risk here? <laughs> and uh, they came back with a handshake. So again, Marty, thank you, and thank you to Dario Gill, who could not be here today. Now, I want to also speak for a minute uh, about the state and the region. In 1990, when I was at IBM and I was the senior executive responsible for the relationship with New York State, the, governor, the then governor of New York uh, called me to the Capitol, the second floor, and said, John, we have a problem in the state. And of course, being a native of New York and the Capitol District, that got my attention. He said, we're losing research, we're losing technology from the state. What can we do? What can we do? And at that time, the semiconductor industry was going through some very hard technical problems and economic challenges. But the bottom line is we, we cooked up a strategy to make the capital district in Albany the epicenter of research and development and advanced semiconductors. And I, I remember the discussion because it was, well, why don't we get a manufacturing fab first? And I said, no, if we get the research and development, the manufacturing will follow. And of course, that has happened with Global Foundries and now Micron in Syracuse. And I want to thank Congressman Tonko for being a steadfast supporter through the decades that it took to build Albany Nanotech into what it is today. It is not only a capital district and a New York State treasure, it is a treasure for this country and internationally. And I believe that this moment will be that kind of pivot point in quantum computing for not only the state and our country, but for the world. Because this is the equivalent of launching what we did in semiconductors decades ago. And we will lead in quantum computing. Now, as Marty said, RPI alumni have built the infrastructure of this country through the Industrial Revolution, the Electronics Age, the Information Age. But now it's about data and it's about computational problems, as uh, Arvind said, that are so big, they just can't be solved any other way than with that beautiful quantum computer. And that means so much opportunity in the applications of these computers to do good for humanity. And I want to end with speaking directly to the students. I know we have lots of important people here, but the most important people here to me are the students. You have been now given a jewel. You have now been given an opportunity that very seldom comes along. Take this opportunity, take this quantum computer, and do things that no one else has ever done, ever done in this world. Do good with it. And my only regret standing here today is that I can't change seats with you because I would love to be sitting in the audience as a student with quantum computing in my future. Congratulations to IBM, congratulations to RBI, congratulations to the state of New York, and congratulations to our students and faculty do good with this system. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, so first, uh, of course, I have to give you the update. Uh, we're going to see how good we are in technology here uh, to show you the, the map of the uh, epicenter, if we can do that. So this is from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, up to date, that uh, you can see the, the star in the middle there in, in New Jersey and the, uh, the rings that go out from that almost up to Albany, over to Hartford, over to Harrisburg, and so on. 
uh, <laughs> there is some certainly spooky science at a distance going on on here this morning. Uh, so with that, uh, please join me in thanking all of our speakers today. It was just terrific. So we are at the end of our program for today, uh, but a couple of notes. Uh, the VCC will be open for general tours uh, this afternoon starting at one o'clock with some sign-up sheets upstairs on the seventh floor of MPAC. I, I would encourage you to go over and look at the system that made it through this earthquake. Um, and thank you for joining us today. And Stewart's has a, a treat for us, literally. Uh, they are scooping as much quantum freeze ice cream as you can eat today and for the rest of the day. Thank you very much.